Okay, so let's dive into Botox and fillers. And so for this, we wanted to try um, a little bit of a different format. So, um, you know, a lot of you who have not done, especially if you have not done Botox or fillers before, have a lot of questions. And so we've kind of gathered the most common questions about those items. And um, Allison is our marketing director who is right now standing behind the camera. She's also the one who sends out the wonderful emails and kind of keeps y'all informed of everything going around, uh, going on at DCA. So today I'm gonna have Allison join me in front of the camera and she is going to ask some of the common questions. And I thought, <laughs> thanks Allison, um, in the location where she usually does not like to be, but she's kind enough to do this. And the reason I really wanted Allison specifically to do this is because almost everyone else in our office has medical experience. And I think a lot of times the questions are come better from someone without any uh, medical background. So Allison has done a little bit of Botox, a little bit of filler, um, had questions beforehand. So some of these questions were hers when she started and she's gonna ask me some questions and I'm just gonna answer. So. All right, so first one, what is Botox and how does it work? Yeah, so Botox is actually, some, it's got a long name, Onobotulinum Toxin A. And what it is, it's a neuromodulator, which means it kind of helps to, uh, what it ends up doing is it temporarily relaxes the muscles. So like right now, if you don't have Botox in and I ask you to frown, your muscle, your brain says frown and a little impulse goes down the nerve and the little muscle contracts. So if we inject Botox, what happens is the same thing happens. Your brain says frown, goes down the little nerve, but there's a little connection there that's temporarily interrupted. So your muscle just sits there going, I can't hear you, so you don't frown. Um, slowly that starts to unwind. You'll get 5% of the movement back, 10, 15, 20, 30%. Usually by three months, about 70 to 80% of that movement's back. And that's when we retreat. So Botox kind of works again by just temporarily relaxing the muscle. Okay. Um, does it hurt? N minimally, I would say, um, you know, it's a tiny, tiny needle that we use to inject it. And honestly, the most common thing I think I hear people say after we do Botox for the first time is they go, is that it? Like they're almost disappointed because it really, it's fast, right? Mm -hmm. It's Super fast. Yeah. Um, so it really, it, it's minimal. We're also big babies here. So we do offer numbing cream. We also do something silly too, which like we tap on you during the treatment, which sounds dumb, but it actually distracts your brain a little bit. So um, it, it makes the whole thing, yeah, much more comfortable, I think. And we have ice and um, it's easy and, qu and very fast. Uh, will my face be frozen? Will I look frozen? Will people be able to tell I've had Botox? That is a good question. And that's something too, I think a lot of times like you see on TV, like the, uh, you know, people have Botox and they make fun of people because they're completely frozen. And that really doesn't happen. I mean, you can you over Botox? Absolutely. But what we do here and, you know, we are, where is it? multi-year winner of the best natural looking uh, Botox from Best Self Magazine. And I think the reason we do that is because we're super cautious. We start very low and slow. Like I'll start everybody with the minimal amount. Um, even people who have done Botox other places before, sometimes they'll come in and they're like, oh, I do everything. I'm like, do you know why? And they're like, no, they've just always done it that way. I'm like, well, let's make sure each piece of your regimen has value to you. And the way I think you do that is you start very slow everybody is put together or hooked up if you will differently remember i told you that the botox works by kind of um, temporarily relaxing the muscle well it's impossible just to look at someone and tell how their muscles are hooked up underneath there with just by looking you really kind of have to do inject the botox botox will diffuse out around a centimeter where you inject so like for free a lot of times you get other areas so for instance if you do the frown a lot of times you'll get some forehead fibers and what we do with all first time patients is again, treat very minimally, have you come back in two to four weeks and at that point assess and see, um, are there other areas that you're moving? Um, like some people go, oh, what, I've seen people with joker brows. Joker brows are super easy to fix. Like that's just a, a little bit of a tweak. Or people say, if some people said, oh, my brows get heavy, that's a lot of times too much Botox all at once. And so again, we minimize those risks by doing it very slowly in the beginning with the overarching goal is to eventually get like a really precise Botox recipe that's yours. So the first visit, maybe two, you know, we see you, we have you come back in two to four weeks, we look together. Um, it's not always like that, it's not that many visits, but I think I would rather be very cautious in the beginning 
and really no, not overstep bounds so that you have a great result and that you're always comfortable in your Botox and again that we end up knowing exactly what you need and where you need to place it. I've only had Botox here, so I'm kind of spoiled, but so, I was worried about the, um, the heaviness yeah. that could happen or like yeah. looking angry or something, mm -hmm. um, but because I've only had it here, I get, I only notice a nice lift in my forehead that right. starts to wear off and then I get sad and I know that I need yeah. to have Botox, <laughs> yeah. um, but now people don't ask me what's wrong anymore Yay. for no reason, which is nice. Yeah. Um, how many, air, or what areas can I treat with Botox? So the most common areas are obviously the frown, the forehead, the crow's feet. Um, we also can treat masseter muscles, which are the, these muscles here. If you clench down, you can feel your masseter. Some people have um, kind of uh, oversized masseter, maybe from grinding your teeth or what have you. So a lot of times it's a nice way to slim the face. We can treat chin dimples. Um, if you have a gummy smile, which is like the people when you smile and you can see too much of your upper gum, you can put a little Botox there. So there's a lot of other little places that you can put the Botox to get a, a result. But again, I think the consult's so important because you wanna make sure, sometimes people come in and they're like, everything bothers me. And I'm like, well, you gotta make sure that, yeah, make sure that each piece of the Botox, like each piece of the Botox treatment makes sense for you so that you get, again, a great result, you look natural, um, and you don't look over Botoxed. Um, how much will I need? Um, that's, different for everybody. And I think that's also why you start very minimally. So interesting. I just had, you know, Tammy who works here, her mm -hmm. husband. So there's a girl who works here, um, known her for, she's been here for 16, 17 years. And her husband ha is a big guy with a really, really strong frown. And he finally, finally, finally came in for Botox. And so I'm thinking he's okay. I'm going to start the way I always do. Cause I think you just have to be consistent with how you treat. So I, I'm going to start with minimal amount thinking to myself, He's gonna need more for sure when I see him back in two to four weeks. It's perfect. So, you know, this is a big guy. On the flip side of that, I'm thinking of a patient right now I have who's this tiny, adorable woman and does not really have that strong of a frown, but for some reason she really needs like a double Botox treatment. So you don't, again, you cannot tell this just looking at somebody. You've really got to do the Botox, see what happens and go from there. So the amounts I think do vary, but we, I always try and err on the side of caution. I think less is more with Botox and um, we just try and inch our way up to what you need. Um, will Botox stop my wrinkles from forming? There is a preventative aspect of Botox. So, so sometimes people will come in, like they'll say, um, I have this line. So they already have the 11s and even at rest. So they're not doing anything and you can see the crease. And we do the Botox and they might come back and go, well, Botox didn't work because I still have the crease. And I say frown and they go, I am frowning. I'm like, okay, the Botox is working because your muscle's not contracting. So the, the crease is in your skin, which really, if you're looking at a cross section, your skin's on top. Underneath that, you have a fine level, level, layer of fat and then, a, then the muscle and then bone. So Botox works down here to stop the muscle from contracting. And so what happens is when you put the Botox in, that skin is not getting folded as much. And so over time, and with repeated Botox treatments, that, that crease will get better. Um, it, but it doesn't happen like right out of the gate. So the preventative part of that is if you keep up with it. And by that, I mean, you don't want more than 70 to 80% of your movement to come back. So typically like a first time patient's gonna come in about every um, three months for the first year. And what you're trying to do is get that muscle to stay weak. So if you never let the muscle come back to its full strength, muscles will thin or atrophy if you don't use them. So you want this to kind of happen on purpose so that you can go longer potentially with your Botox. And along that journey, the skin, that crease will start to soften. But again, it's just, your skin has to kind of have a moment to realize it's not getting crunched as hard as it was before, and then it starts to help. So the, that's preventative. Or on the flip side, like um, sometimes I'll have, I've, now, I've been doing this long enough now for over 25 years that I actually have some of my patients who are sending their daughters in because they're like, she makes the same face I made at 25 or 26, and I know she's gonna end up with this crease. And so, um, and she has the same frown I do. And so a lot of times if you get a, a, in front of it that way, the crease never forms either. Um, so yes, there's a ton of prevention, which I think is Botox's strength too. 
Uh, along those lines, do your muscles get dependent upon Botox? No. So like if you um, you don't need the Botox, like let's say a lot of times people will ask too, like if, what happens if I stop doing Botox? Let's say you do Botox for 10 years and then all of a sudden you decide, I don't want to do it anymore. Well, the good news is all that preventative stuff that you've been doing for 10 years, you get to keep. That's wonderful. And then eventually your muscle strength just comes back to the where it was. So there's no way someone could look at you. Um, if you stop, if you did ten, Botox for 10 years and then you stop and five years down the road, there's like some kind of an issue because you did it then. Juju, um, how will I notice, when will I notice results from my Botox? So Botox usually kicks in, um, you, we tell people wait about two weeks because it, and it's interesting. Some people it kicks in really fast. Um, other people, it kind of, I'll say hiccups to life where was, people will go, oh my God, my left side took and my right side didn't, but it's like, just wait. <laughs> other times it takes, it's just a gradual thing. Or sometimes it looks like nothing happened whatsoever. And all of a sudden on like day seven or eight, it all kicks in. There's a million different ways it can happen. So we always tell, and this is why we wait two to four weeks to do our quick peek. Cause we want to make sure that, um, the Botox has time to take effect, but typically at two weeks it kicks in. How long does it last? Um, so about, you know, I would say on average, the first year you're going to come out every three months for the frown. Crow's feet are a little bit different because instead of having, the frown has three little muscles. It's super easy to control. Yeah. But with the crow's feet, it's a big muscle that encircles your eye. Um, foreheads also similarly big muscle, like a muscle sheet that goes from your brow into your scalp. And when you're having those bigger muscles where you're only, you only want a piece of them. You just want it, oh, this area, not the whole area. Um, typically in those areas, the Botox will come back in about three to five months, depending on how you wear it. So everybody's different. Um, if you're not ready for Botox, we'll t send you home. Actually happened the other day. I had a woman like a first or second time treating. And for some reason she holds her Botox extremely long. So I was like, lucky. yeah, yeah, she's lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say an average, like three, four months. So how often do I have to do yep. it? About three yeah. or four months. Mm -hmm. um, does Botox, does it all of a sudden go away or is it a gradual? It's usually away? gradual. Like, yeah, so it's not like some people think it's, you're going to fall off a cliff, but it doesn't. It kind of takes effect and then it gradually wears off. And again, so you want to treat when 70 to 80% of the movement's back. How much does it cost? That varies too. So I think, you know, it starts at about 350, but, um, Again, we try and do the minimal amount and then build from there. So even if you're doing multiple areas, we want to kind of make sure that it's, it's what you need. So it does vary from patient to patient. When should I start getting Botox? How early is too early? Um, I think when you start noticing, most, pe most of my Botox patients probably start in their um, 20s, I would say, 20s, 30s, 40s. Actually, that's not true. I have patients, I would say from, I would say 25 to 55 is probably the, the sweet spot, but I have patients, honestly, I'm treating a little, that are a little bit more mature, but you can't treat, if it's too much laxity in the skin, there's too much lines or wrinkles. Sometimes um, the Botox is really not that gratifying because the lines just really um, can't soften with the Botox alone. Can Botox lift my face? Ah, uh, no. Unfortunately, that is what fillers are for. Yes. <laughs> Okay, and that's Botox. Mm -hmm. Those are all of our Botox questions. So filler, how are Botox and filler different? So Botox, like we talked about, is a neuromodulator that kind of temporarily relaxes the muscle. And fillers fill. So fillers completely different where you're actually trying to go into the skin to um, either create lift or soften some of the finer lines. Um, there's a lot of different types of fillers out there now. And so there's a lot of different ways that you can approach fillers. It's, just, it's a lot more fun than it was many years ago when we had just one product, but yeah, they're different. What are they made out of? Um, so different, the filler, most of the fillers we use are made of, out of hyaluronic acid. Um, I like that product personally because, um, it, it's in our skin naturally. We lose it as we age. So you're replacing like with like, and, um, you also can get collagen building with repeated treatments, which is great. And you could take it out. So like, let's say you did the filler and for whatever reason you're like, I don't like it, or I just don't want it. I don't want to wait for it to go away. There's an enzyme also naturally found in our body called hyaluronidase, and you could um, dissolve the filler that way. So I think it's nice. We have some other fillers we use, like Sculptra, which is um, made from poly L lactic acid. Um, that's more, uh, it's a longer lasting filler, but it's not as precise, and it's a really great collagen builder. Typically, I'll use that in, I will say, more mature patients that need. 
um, just kind of global collagen enhancement um, in addition to some lifting. And usually it's not either or, we might do both, but it's not necessarily a first time patient product. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear a lot of names for different fillers on Instagram and uh, on TV and you see commercials. I've heard of Juvederm, I've heard of Voluma, I've heard of Restylin. Um, how are they different? So that's a great question. So we, I don't know, we have five, six, seven different types of the hyaluronic acid fillers, but I think of them as like, um, they have different specialties, if you will. So for instance, Voluma is probably a workhorse in our practice because it does create a lot of um, lift. So people who come in and say, well, I've got these jowls or these folds are really heavy or even the eye, the eye area, um, that's a great place to start where you're starting with, I think, of a structure or framework issues with the face. Um, and it's the one that has the most push or lift to it. And then on the other end of the spectrum, for instance, is a product called Vobella, where um, let's say you have really fine lines um, or you want to fill underneath the eye area where that's very delicate skin. We don't want the filler to show. We want the thinnest filler we can have. So that's Vobella is really soft. It's a great skin smoother. Um, it's wonderful for very modest and natural looking lips because it just really, it's not going to create this ton of push. People get afraid of that, that big lip look and that doesn't cause that. And there's everything in between. So, um, you know, what's nice is you don't ever, you don't ever have to know what filler you need. I mean, when you come in, we talk about it and kind of determine what the needs are and then what, what, how do we match up with the, the correct filler product. Uh, with Botox, you talked about a recipe. Is there a filler recipe or does it change? Do you just adapt every time? Yeah, so fillers are different because fillers are definitely more of a journey where you're, you know, the way I treat with fillers is, you know, you come in and, you know, we assess. Well, first we do a consult, obviously, and it's a thorough assessment, making sure you're a good candidate. And then once, we, if we decide we we're going to start with the fillers, we just start honestly one at a time, one syringe at a time. Fillers are instant gratification, which is great. So you can look in the mirror right afterwards and kind of see where you are. And um, after each syringe of filler, I let people look in the mirror and kind of we look together and determine like, is that a good change for today? Does that feel good? Most of my patients come in um, every four to six months. And that's because I treat very conservatively. Like I think you, it's nicer to have this gradual building and change versus boom, you did something. Like I don't want people looking at you going, oh, what did you do? I think it should be, oh, you look great. But you get to be in control of how quickly or how slowly you move within the session. Like again, as we look together, do we, do we need a second syringe? Do we want to do a third? Are we good with just one? Like we'll talk about that. And then how quickly you come in after any session, you can come back as soon as four to six weeks. You just don't want to wait more than four to six months. And the reason is, even that some of these fillers last actually much longer than six months, but you want something there to build on. Like in other words, sometimes people will come back and I'll see them like a couple years later and they're like, oh, I loved what you did last time. I'm like, that's great, except it's all gone and you're two years older and it's harder to get you back to where you were. So to me, it's like it's better to kind of have a slow, gradual improvement and just keeping things looking a little bit more steady. I noticed that after I get filler, I get a lot of compliments on my skin. Mm -hmm. People think my skin just looks great. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, of course, talk about all of our skincare products, yeah. which is definitely a reason yeah. why my skin looks good. But um, a lot of it is yeah. filler. Well, I think it, the filler does help in that. Again, you get the collagen building, but also when you help with volume deficits, whether it's under the eyes or around the chin, that's an important area of the cheeks. I think it does sometimes allow you to see features like you have beautiful skin. So you can see the pretty skin a little bit better because you're not focused on the things that are quote unquote wrong um, with face. Um, where do you inject them? So it depends. And so the, uh, I love that question because a lot of people go, where exactly are you going to put the filler? And um, I always say that's like giving me a blank canvas and a bunch of paint and then your favorite dog, and you say, I want you to paint my dog, but I want you to tell me exactly how you're gonna paint my dog. I'm like, I don't know. So the way I treat is you lay back and eat. So each syringe is one cc, it's like a fifth of a teaspoon, it's not a lot, but each tiny aliquot you put in, you're gonna sit back up and I'm gonna evaluate because um, we get a little bit, I get OCD about two things. One is symmetry. No one is perfectly symmetric, but I think, you know, each little bit will do something and you want to kind of approach symmetry. You never want to cram a face into symmetry because that would make you look fundamentally different and that's not good, but I think if it gets more symmetric, it's pretty. The other thing that's really important is creating a balance between the upper half and lower half of the face because sometimes like people will come in and they're very hyper-focused on 
the eye area or the mouth area, like one or these lines or something very specific, and that's the only thing they want to do. And if you change one thing on a face, you would everyone notices like, oh, what did you do to your lips or what did you do your your lines that were there? But if everything gets a little bit better, if this is lifted a little bit, this is a little bit softer. The eye, it, it's hard to notice, and I think that is how you get these natural looking results because you didn't lose volume in one spot on your face. You lost it everywhere. And so I think the goal is by the time you come in for fillers, you've lost a lot of volume in a lot of different areas. And again, you're not gonna put it all back in one session. You're gonna do it over time. So you just have to kind of put it in wisely. We use a combination of um, needles, which everyone knows what a needle is, but also cannulas. And cannulas, um, I'll just explain that briefly. They're, they're long, blunt tip flexible wands you've been treated with the cannula you know it's I, I think it's a kinder gentler way to treat it's just different um so for instance if we were going to treat like allison's cheek i might put an injection point there um, the cannula attaches to the syringe and then i could treat like this whole area this way with thin little ribbons of filler i could go in this direction too so you could treat almost an entire cheek through one injection point it reduces your risk of bruising that way um, again because it's a blunt tipped wand it's it's gentler than just a bunch of needles. So I think it's, again, a kinder, gentler way to treat. It's just that you can't do everything with the cannula and you can't do everything with the needle. So we do a little bit of both depending on the need. And again, it's a careful evaluation. So you'll lay back, you sit up a lot. It's, we always say it's a core class because um, you gotta do a lot of sit-ups. And again, we numb beforehand. We do the tapping like we do for Botox. So it's comfortable. Um, how long does it take? to get a filler treatment? Um, it's not long. So uh, again, a lot of the time is just evaluating. Um, so, but I would say most of the patients are in maybe, if you numb, it might take longer, maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Um, when will I see my results? So we, like we talked about right afterwards, you can see. So right, when you're done, we can show you the mirror. And you know, it's funny, the most common thing patients will say right after I treat like with the first time, which is usually blue, they'll look in the mirror and they'll say, why do I look better? And I love, I love that because it means you recognize you do look better, but um, you can't tell what happened, which means like your best friend's not going to look at you and know, oh, you did filler. So it's subtle, but yeah, you can see it immediately. It does take though, about, I say about two weeks for the filler to settle, if you will. Remember I told you they're hyaluronic acid based fillers, so they do incorporate with your skin. Sometimes after fillers, you can get a little bit of swelling, um, potentially some bruising. So, you know, um, we give you some tips on how to minimize those risks, but I would say two weeks for it, to, for you to really get an idea of where you're gonna land with it. I remember the first time I got filler and I sat up and looked in the mirror and I did not know what was different, but I just, I remember saying out loud, it's like me in college. That's just, <laughs> I just saw college me looking back yeah. and it was, it was very weird, but very, very nice. Yeah. Um, so how often do I need them? Fillers, um, again, probably every four to six months in, in the beginning, you know, depending on what your needs are too. So I've got sometimes patients, if they're a little bit more mature and maybe have a little bit more laxity in their skin, they might want to come a little bit more frequently. They might be doing more syringes in the beginning. And then as they're starting to get closer to what they want to see for maintenance, they'll start to back down. Um, other patients that are starting, or like you, when you're, you're younger, you, she, Allison's gorgeous, so she doesn't need that much, so she might only come twice a year just for little touch-ups. Can I be allergic? So good question. So hyaluronic acid, since it's found in our skin naturally, um, you're not going to be allergic to that part of it. There is lidocaine that's in the um, syringe too, which actually makes your injections more comfortable. So if you had any kind of lidocaine sensitivities, like at the dentist or something, you need to let us know about that. Uh, so side effects? Um, so biggest risk would be bruising. You know, again, we can give you some information uh, on things that you can do to reduce your risk, like you don't want to take any blood thinning products a week prior. Um, but really, most people, if you get bruising, it's usually pinpricky stuff that you can cover with makeup. Once in a while, we'll see kind of a, you know, a, more of a purple bruise. And once in a very rare while, you can get, you know, like a, the good bruise. If any of that happens, though, we do have something called a V-beam laser, and we're happy to zap the bruise for you um, if it happens. Uh, you have to wait about two days for the, about 48 hours for the bruise to quote unquote set. Then we zap the bruise. It makes it look um, a little bit better faster. 
to be safe, I tell everyone, don't do fillers within two weeks of any social event you care about, just in case, because you could do this 10 times and sometimes you bruise and sometimes you don't, you know, so you just have to kind of, I like, to, I'm a worst case scenario thinker, so I like to assume that I'm gonna bruise every time and then if I don't, I'm pleasantly surprised. <laughs> uh, kind of like the Botox question, if I stop doing filler, will my skin get saggier? Yeah. So, um, and I get that question too. People think that, you know, it's going to be like a tissue expander almost in your skin where if you don't, it'll deflate, but it's not because, because these fillers do create some collagen building. Um, let's say again, in this example we used before where you do fillers for 10 years and then you stop, you're actually going to have a benefit for sure with that. I can think of some patients in my head specifically where their skin, like, their skin looks better, their lines are better, they have better volume, and they just start aging from that, this point. Because obviously, whether you do fillers or you don't do fillers, you're going to continue to age. So this, I think, just kind of helps to mitigate it a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then what can I do to prepare for my filler appointment? So you can avoid the blood thinning products like mm -hmm. we talked about. So that would be um, any NSAIDs like Advil, Aleve, um, aspirin. Aspirin's actually two weeks because it's a bigger offender, but um, vitamin E, fish oil, turmeric, garlic, um, ginkgo, yeah, biloba, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to spell, so <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's, um, there's a few things. And again, we give you a little list to, to help you to minimize those risks. Um, and can it leak out of your face after you <laughs> injected in? I actually have had a couple of questions a couple of times too. No, it can't leak out of your face, so it won't do that. People, I do ask too, does it shift? Which mm -hmm. no, it can't, it can't unless like, um, we always tell people after their filler appointment not to do anything where there's firm pressure on your face for a couple of weeks afterwards. Like don't get um, like swimming goggles or like if you're, your head's in a massage cradle, for like you know 30 minutes or um, if you're getting dental work with a dental dam where your mouth is pried open for two hours like those yeah. are the things you don't want to do but i think other than that it's pretty safe i think you know um it's one thing we didn't talk about but i think we should is you know the fear of fillers and i think the fear is not necessarily sometimes the side effects like we've been talking about but a lot of times it's how you look because mm -hmm. i've seen this i know y'all seen this like you can go to Publix and see someone with like big lips or big cheeks and you're just like what did they do to their face that's I call it a pillow face yeah that's and that's oh i always say you know what we're our goal and the, we, the way i approach fillers is you want to do very gradual and very respectful volume replacement when you see fillers out in the real world what you're witnessing is volume over replacement now the, everyone has their own aesthetic. So, you know, the, the woman with the big lips, the big cheeks, she might look and feel great. And if so, more power to her, that's great. And there's an injector out there that's doing the injection and he or she thinks that looks great and they're very happy together. That is not my <laughs> aesthetic. Um, I am a very conservative injector and I tell that people that up front because if they're looking for the big lip or the big cheek, they're not gonna be happy with, with me or anybody here at DCA. So I think, um, again, you have to kind of match what your aesthetic is with your provider, but I like a natural looking result. I think that looks best. I'm not into trying to, you know, have everyone look like, you know, um, the overblown look. It's just not our, our vibe here. People kind of uh, beat around the question often, uh, not wanting to, and I just come out and say, you don't look like a Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just about looking natural. I'm looking the best for you. And again, this is why it's important to evaluate a lot so that we make sure that we're stopping at a point that makes you feel good. All right, so that's, thank you, Allison, for thank coming you. out from behind the camera and asking those great questions. And I hope you all found this useful.